Hello, everyone. I'm Jonathan Hollander, a Fulbright lecturer in India, a Fulbright specialist in Malaysia, member of the Fulbright specialist panel, and most relevant to my task this afternoon, which I relish, I was the Selma Jean Cohen speaker two years ago in the very different environment of Puebla, Mexico. I shift gears here to introduce Janaki Patrick, the remarkable dancer, choreographer, teacher, and scholar who will bring us into the area she knows so well, India, and the magnificent field of Katak dance. I'm reminded of my perusal of Selma Jean Cohen's International Encyclopedia of Dance and finding extensive coverage of Indian dance therein. I have no doubt that she would have approved wholeheartedly of Janaki and her presentation this afternoon. Janaki is a disciple of India's most revered Katak maestro, about whom she will tell you in her presentation. In fact, it may not be an overstatement to say that Janaki is in the small elite handful of dancers not born in India who have mastered this most complex art form, an opinion that I heard echoed by experts in India itself. I was intrigued by Janaki's thesis for her talk related to improvisation and I have no doubt that all of you from whatever fields you come from will share my fascination. Janaki is a magnificent dancer whose performances I've had the honor of attending for decades. I've seen her transition from a dancer to a choreographer to an entrepreneur and to a scholar because of her incredible musical background as well as covering the fields of modern dance under Merce Cunningham, who was also my mentor, and this remarkable achievement in Katak and in languages, Indian languages, so that she can understand the poetry and meaning of these dances and the songs that sometimes accompany them. She is a singular person in the world, and I'm very, very proud to present Janaki Patrick for the Selma Jean Cohen speech today. Namaste, Salam, and thank you very much, Jonathan, for that introduction. I am presenting on the topic of improvisation in Qatar. And I will say that I saw Selma Jean Cohen at many, many of the same performances that I happened to attend and she was attending in New York City. And one of my students, Katie Matheson, was her assistant and co-editor for the wonderful book entitled uh, Dance as a Theater Art. Katie also asked me many questions because she was helping with the International Encyclopedia of Dance, which Selma Jean Cohen um, edit, uh, worked on for several decades. My topic, improvisation in Katak dance, is partly instigated because when I was at Katak Kendra and I asked the musicians during their lunch break, which was several hours long in the monsoon heat, if they would play just a little bit for me so I could practice. Well, they said, yes, I was going to pay them. They played for a couple of minutes and then just nonchalantly packed up and said, Oh, Janaki, leave it to Maharaji. As if only the top one half of 1% could improvise. Well, being an American and quite bold, I didn't agree with that. And moreover, I knew that I'd been improvising and children and adults all over improvise their whole lives, dancing, singing, for whatever reason. Um, so you, that's why you'll wonder, how did I learn so much kata? What prompted me to study to that extent that I am able to talk about improvisation, a small part of our art. 
uh, that's because of my life. My, um, I started the, the pathways of study and learning start very, very young. And I took that with me to my study. Um, my uh, father had been a boy soprano soloist at Grace Church in New York City. My parents, my father did Morris dance and all of us, our whole family um, participated in English country dance. It was a wonderful, fun event. Huge trees on this estate and an asphalt dance floor in the middle of the woods. My father danced Morris dance. That was only for the men around a maypole with bells on their ankles. And I wanted to have bells too. I guess I loved the sound. So I, my father also uh, would uh, improvise at the piano, play by ear and sing. The piano was always open. I fiddled around with it. And then my father said, would you like lessons? My parents found the most wonderful children's piano teacher. And that was my introduction to formal music. Then I started studying the next year when I was eight years old, I started studying uh, flute. And my flute training went on for 13 years. The last two years were under the uh, tutelage of first chair of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, Donald Peck. So you, know, you understand to what degree I was trained. And I also, in high school, the last two years of high school, Russian was offered. It was the age of Sputnik. And my gym teacher went to Russia instead of taking another summer re recertification course in basketball. She went to Russia and brought back the wonderful poetry of Pushkin. And she taught principally in, in an oral tradition, reciting Yavas Lublu, Lubil, Lublov, Yescho, Bit Mojit, Duche, Maeo, Gaslinis, Yosin. It was so amazingly beautiful and so full of emotion. I just loved it. And starting from there, I was never, I never minded the, the uh, memorization that you need to do to gain that critical mass of vocabulary so that you could guess what something meant when you didn't really know the meaning of the word. Um, I, I carried that on into college and Russian was my major. And again, there was quite a bit of oral tradition in my, in my learning. Um, my college teacher had been in Russia uh, the year before he started teaching and um, at Swarthmore and I was in the first class that he, in the first class uh, that he taught. So it was oral because many poems had to be recited, not written, or you could be sent to a gulag because you were thought to be uh, submersive, so, uh, subversive. Um, and so uh, we recited the poetry. We read aloud our papers on Dostoevsky and Pushkin. And again, I didn't mind the, uh, I didn't mind the memorization because uh, it was a beautiful language and I didn't mind learning how to write it. Uh, I saw Maharaji, my guru, in 1963, my thir first year at Swarthmore. And I was immediately uh, shocked, astonished. And my husband calls it the epiphany because in that moment of seeing him, I decided that that was going to be what I did. And so I, I wrote to his institution, Katak Kendra, and in 1967, I went to India for an audition. That was what they told me I could come for. Um, of course, I, I started studying with him and I started studying at the school. You had to also study percussion. I studied tabla with Purushottam Das, the Pakawich player and vocal with Siteshwari Devi. These were top, great, great artists. But when the government made the transition from patronage by the Badshah, by the Nawabs, by the landowners, they decided to 
uh, established institutions, which also, because it was just post-independence, proved the glory of Indian culture, and they got the best. The Dagger brothers, people like Purushottam Dasji and Mataji, Siddheshwari Devi. I was the recipient of this glorious tradition. They treated me like their daughter, partly because they were older, but also they were astonished that I brought to them such sophisticated knowledge and feeling and intuition in what they loved, which was rhythm and melody. Uh, so they gave me wholeheartedly, whereas the tradition before independence and even now is to hide your treasures except for your inner circle. Uh, so when I went into class and I had first only one classmate, then, two, then a second classmate, there were just three of us. You see us on stage at, in our end of year performance. When we went into class, we did not take paper and pencil. This, is, this tradition is learned orally and in person. It's called parampara, silsila. Silsila means chain. Parampara is the tradition of passing on from father to son to grandson. And so uh, we, I devised a system of notation because I knew we didn't have cell phones. You couldn't even call. I couldn't, I couldn't just pick up the phone and say, oh Maharaji, I forgot what that was. So I notated, I spent the entire day, first in my morning class, then afternoon watching the uh, older, the, the more advanced classes and rehearsals. And in the evening, Manaranjan, my uh, male classmate and I went in the car with Maharaji to see all of his evening private tuitions. An incredible, in incredible um, education. Uh, so I would then come home and late at night start my notation. You can see the notation here. It is written in, um, in Dave Nagari, which is the script of uh, Hindi, Sanskrit, and many of the North, North Indian dialects. Uh, if you ha are dealing with a phonetic language like Russian and Sanskrit, the letters tell you how to, re how to pronounce. It, it, that's, that means it's a phonetic language. And so I needed to learn in both cases. I needed to learn the script so I could say it properly. And um, I will say a simple composition that you see written here. And my notation starting at the bottom went on for four more pages because Katak is a very detailed uh, style. If my hand goes to the side, goes or goes diagonally, my eyes go there. And I'll, I'll just recite that composition and then we'll turn off the video on me and make it larger and you'll be able to see the entire comp simple composition that I'm going to do with you. Um, so I'm going to recite first a simple Home. So I'm marking the four four beat divisions in this 16 beat. Eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, four, six, so now that's a simple one. That's the basic. From the basic, you can create endless variations. That's one of the resources that we have for improvisation. It's called bol parhant. Bol means a syllable and parhant means recitation. So I'm going to go a little bit longer, repetition three times, and here we go. Home. Home is called some. 
So we have so many very simple and in our body, embedded in our body, ways to keep track of time. I don't need to count that. I hear it. I hear it in the melody that's going to accompany us. And what we will learn is a very simple tukra. Tut, tut, te, te, tik da, dik, dik, te. Music. Tut, tut, te. I'll start it with the music. Tut, tut, te, te, dik da, dik, dik, te. Tut, tut, te, te, dik da, dik, dik, te. Tut, tut, te, te, dik da, dik, dik, te. Dik da, dik, dik, te. Dig da, dig, dig, te. Dig da, dig, dig, te. And the movements with it. Where I move my arm, there goes my eye. And then I'm going to do turning. If you want to do the turning, you can. We have to use spotting. We spot and then we turn our head very quickly and come back home. But you can just do the feet with me, the feet and the arms and I'm going to make a sound for each one of those syllables. Hey, 
dancers to speak that composition or just to stamp your feet so that you experience um, what it really is like to do a very uh, to do a, a composition and and understand partly um, uh, what it is to dance a form where you're not reading music you don't have notes in front of you of what you're going to do you have the, you have everything you need in your mind and you've got the music that is telling you where you are. We were dancing to a melody that took exactly 16 beats and you hear the melody. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Climb the stairs up to some to the first beat. Climb the stairs up to first beat. To, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, home. We have everything we need through our ears and in our inner brain, but subconsciously. All of our think power is reserved for creating and thinking about what we're doing next in an improvisation. Well, when I came back from India, of course, I wanted to dance. I wanted to perform and share this great art. Luckily, when I came to Chicago, there was an organization, Urban Gateways. The gateways were opening for inner city children who were not privileged enough to go to live performances. So we brought them into the schools. I worked, you can see that I have a rucksack on my back with the heavy pair of tabla drums and a suitcase full of my costumes and all the resources that I needed to share this with children. Saris for the children to tie on, um, and uh, uh, bells, many things, including a turban. And it was the height of happiness and glee in the children if I tied it on their principal. So that's called, it was called the puggity. And if the turban went on the principal, that was just wonderful. In, case, in fact, I started bringing along a ready-made turban that I didn't have to even tie on the principal. So um, I played with um, uh, a, a company. Uh, my partner was Darlene Blackburn, an Afro-American who had been trained in Nigerian dance in Nigeria, and Brother Harold, who played the djembe. We played a duet together so that the children would hear a real tabla drum and a real djembe. But the greatest lesson for children was to see in this time of incredible turmoil in 1970, 69, 70, and half of 71, uh, they saw an American and an Afro-American dance performing together on the stage together. Uh, it, it was an incredible lesson without any words. One of, now children are a very discriminating audience. If you talk down to them, you lose them. You have to be honest with them and loving. So uh, one of the things that happened, we came into a school and the principal said, one of our students is losing her sight. Can we possibly incorporate her and dance with her? So Darlene, Brother Harold and I were in the center of a big cafeteria room that had been cleared. And the little girl who was losing sight was there with us. The whole school, every teacher, the principal, every student, the people in who were working in the kitchen, all came and danced. And it's like we were hugging that little girl. Those experiences feed you and make you forget about the long schlep on public transportation, great distances to get to that school. Uh, after two years in Chicago, I felt that I needed better training in um, and to continue the training of my body. 
So I moved to New York City and started and with the object that I wanted to study with Merce Cunningham. I always knew exactly, precisely, I wanted to study only with Pandit, with Birju Maharaj, only with Merce Cunningham. I felt that the training that he gave was very classical in the technique. Look at the bodies, how beautifully trained they are. Uh, and moreover, he was such an experimenter in the technique and in his pieces. So one summer we had a class where every few days he changed the time cycle. I have it all written down in my diary. I'm not imagining it. If the, if the class was going to be in sevens, the exercise in six would be in sevens. If it was going to be in 11, the exercise in six was in 11. Everything, center floor combination, across the floor combination, warm up, everything would be in that chosen time cycle. And that's an incredible um, lesson in improvisation. Another incredible lesson was when I took a choreography workshop and also the many, many, many performances that I went to of Merce. Everyone that was in New York City while I was at the studio, I went to every single one. He started doing what he called events. He took different pieces from different full length um, choreographies and he's juxtaposed them. And what would happen was so phenomenal. It wasn't as if it didn't have any meaning. The meaning was created by the dancers and the interaction. So uh, uh, in 1974, Merce gave me a break, a permission to take a break and be the tour manager for um, my guru, Pandit Birju Maharaj's United States tour. And boy, was that an incredible lesson to see what was supposedly the same solo day after day. Well, it was never the same. First of all, the people watching were different. The energy you got from them was different. The, uh, the stage size was different. One of the most phenomenal happened because a couple happened to love Indian music and dance. They loved Maharaji and he loved them back. The whole group in the tour, three musicians, Maharaji, the dancer Shashwati, and Kumudini Lakia. That couple loved us all and took care of us, ushered us around and gave us a feeling of great warmth. And before the, that performance, Maharaji sang in the, in the green room and was so happy. And when he got on stage, it was phenomenal. Improvisations not only change the material or where you're going to be on stage, but what you get back so some diet today you might want to look up the word, the, the aesthetic theory of Indian music and dance is called rasa. And rasa means gravy or juice. The juice that you share back and forth between audience and, um, and performing, performers is extremely important. Uh, inspired by Maharaji's, uh, by being the tour manager, seeing so many performances, uh, I wanted to have my own group and have live musicians. That's really the only way you can improvise. And it happened that I was able to put together a group with three musicians. The first was Paul Leake, who is a, um, uh, a tabla player and had been trained for a decade by the great tabla player Karamatula Khan uh, in Calcutta. Um, one of the accompanists at the Cunningham studio for our classes, Larry Porter, had studied Rabab in Afghanistan, and he studied Sarod in India. The third member, Harriet Huri, vocalist, North Indian vocalist, had been trained for many years in Banaras, Varanasi. And so we made a group and performed a lot. And at one of those performances, <clears throat> a student from Guyana of the legendary dancer Durgalal, who had been stationed there for a, th a three year uh, tour um, as a teacher in Guyana. Uh, he was coming, she needed help in getting an audience, she asked me. 
But when Durhalal met me and found out that I was a student of Birju Maharaj, he said, okay, that's it, you dance with me. Well, that was another lesson in improvisation. Um, to see him change his compositions from a solo to a duet and, all the, and also what he taught me about performance practice and how I would adjust to him. It was a phenomenal experience. So the, the next two uh, photos are of me dancing. <clears throat> uh, the first in black and white from uh, the 1990s. Uh, and um, the, fi the final one from the, um, from the 21st century. Uh, so lots and lots of, lots and lots of performing. And um, I, I, I have never tired of the, the greatness. I call it, whenever I write about it, I say the great art of Qatar. It is such a full art, beautiful poetry, um, an incredible technique that you can use for tradition or for, um, uh, for innovative works. And uh, I, uh, when I finished my training uh, under MERS, I then continued on with my group of musicians, which gave me a tremendous amount of uh, flexibility of what I could perform and how I could create within the tradition. Uh, and so one of the things I've been fascinated by was um, poetry that's recited sounds like rap. Uh, that's not part of our tradition or not what Maharaji taught me. Um, but um, uh, I, I must say that in, in the interim, uh, in 1988, I had the great good fortune to um, study uh, on, with the support of the Fulbright Foundation Senior Research Fellowship. I'm indebted to them. It was a seminal year for me and took me from being just a student performer, a classroom for performer, to being a researcher and an accepted member of the Katak community. The, the Fulbright allowed me to travel. It was not only the money, but that they made arrangements. I believe at that time you still could only make uh, your reservation on the day of wherever you wanted to travel. They didn't yet have internet and all of the booking uh, apps that we have now. So um, they made my travel arrangements, where I would stay, where I would eat, how I would meet, be, be driven from the train station to the uh, to the people I was meeting. And most importantly, I met three great female gurus on that Fulbright trip. Um, two of them I had already met. Rohini Bhate, a great musician and teacher choreographer, a mentor, a true mentor. And uh, she was in Pune. I went to Ahmedabad and met Kumudini Lakia, who is a very renowned, still alive, modern <clears throat> Kata choreographer, and Maya Rao, who had been a student of Maharaji's uncle, Shambhu Maharaj, who was still alive when I went to um, Kata Kendra in 1967. After, uh, or actually during this whole period, after I was uh, returned from my tour and after I had formed the Katak Ensemble, uh, I started studying in New York City with uh, Nala Najin, who had also been trained in Jaipur tradition, which has these wonderful Kavita Torah, which are like rap. And I learned a few from Nala and I will recite them with, I'll recite it first throughout and you'll hear the sort of, the sort of sing song uh, nursery rhyme rhythm and the um, uh, sort of dog girl. Um, I'll recite it and then I'll talk a little bit more about it and then I'll recite it slowly. You'll recite it with me and then I'll show you the movements. Pum, pum, pug a daddy, fum, fum, funny, bada, bum, bum, bim, the gutter, and never laugh. 
ಭಾವರ ಗೋಸಕ ಲಿಂಗಿ ಕರ ಜಟ ಮೀನ ಮನೋಹರ ಅತಿ ಚವಿ ನೀರಕ ದೇವ ವಿಮಾನ ಪುಷ್ಪ ನಭ ಬರ ಸತ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ನ ಚತ ಕಥಿತ ತಥಿತ 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 Three times to end a composition. Those three syllables, ta, te, tat, are apocryphally said to be the, uh, the sounds of Krishna dancing on the hood of Kaliya. So the story is that Kaliya, a serpent, with his funny, they're called funny, his woods, was poisoning the waters of a little whirlpool in a tiny stream. And the villagers were dying and their cows were dying. So Krishna dove in and danced, caught hold of Kaliya and danced on his foot hoods. He danced joyfully. He did not kill. The name of this is Kaliya Daman. Kaliya, the control of, them, of Kaliya, not Kaliya Mardana, which some people dance. Mardana means the killing. He was not killed. Krishna is in the Vaishnav tradition. That tradition is from Vishnu, the preserver. And so this is a beautiful story that the source of our dance and the sounds of our dance are from Krishna dancing in joy, in ecstasy, as he controls Kaliya and says, go to the ocean. You won't hurt people there. This is for the little people. So now I'm going to stand up. Maybe you can stand up and uh, we'll, we'll recite together. What you'll see, pum pum, is Krishna clapping and motioning to his feet. Pum pum. Pagadari on the head. Thum, thum, funny para. Bum, bum, pinati karata nabula. Kali is wiser saying, don't kill. He's our Lord. He's the Lord of the serpents. Don't kill him. Bhavara Gora, this horrendous, this frightening whirlpool. Bhavara Gora, Kalindi, that's the name of it. Kalindi, Garajata, it's roaring. Garajata. The fish, hand on top of hand, and here it begins. Mina Manohara, they're so beautiful. A-OK, and move your head from side to side. Deva, the gods and goddesses in the heavens put on their crowns. Deva Bimana, Pushpa Nabhabhara Sata. Raining down flowers from heaven. Pushpa Nava Bada Sata. Krishna, Krishna plays a flute. Left palm in, right palm out. Exactly how I held my flute. Palm, Krishna, Nachata. Okay, I hold my flute on the right side. Krishna, Nachata, Krishna dances. Tati tat, tati tat, tati tat. Tati tat, tati tat, tati tat. So slowly, we'll, you can just do the movements. You don't have to turn. I'm just going to do my feet. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Again, I'll remind you, Tihai, and this is going to be one of the resources we have for improvisation, and I'll say that word in a couple of minutes. Oh. Thumb, thumb, funny para. Bum, bum, finity, karata nabala. The young women, the young wives. Pamela gore, kalindi, karajata. This frightening whirlpool is roaring, karajata. Fish. Deva, Vimana, Pushpa, Nata, Bara, Sata, 
Krishna Machata. One more time. And now, as you hear, this is really doggo. It's sing song. It's like all the things we have in nursery rhymes. You repeat the syllables. So it's just pum pum. Pugga. Pugga is put. Pugga tie. Pum pum. Funny. Pada. Krishna dances on the hoods. Funny. Pum pum. Pum pum. Funny. Pada. Pum pum. Pinati. Pada. Pada. Deva gods and goddesses in the heavens. Pushma Nava Bada Sata Krishna Najata Tati 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 With the music, I'll just say it with the music and do it half time. Um, starting position, our zero, our home. Thumb, thumb, thugga, die. Thumb, thumb, funny, bud. Bum, bum, in the tikka, rata, na, ba, la. Avara, kor, kalindi, gara, chata, ni, na, ma, no, ta, Deva, the man, Pushma, Nava, Varasa, Krishna, Lachata, Tati, 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 some of the things that I danced in young audiences, because as soon as I got to New York City, I hooked up again with a wonderful um, in, uh, national or organization, Young Audiences. And I performed throughout the school system in New York City and for some years in New Jersey. Uh, some of the, again, these were lessons in improvisation because um, you never knew whether you're gonna have a stage, a lunchroom, whether the tables in the lunchroom would be put on the sides or whether you'd be dancing up and down the aisles. One time they put me in the shower room of the gymnasium and there were tiny little white tiles sloping down to a big central drain. Well, they happened to be sixth graders, one of the most difficult age um, groups because they're still sort of interested but you've really got to engage them or you lose them and they just start talking. They started out by talking, of course, with the, in their hormone crazed bodies, uh, with them um, started talking about arranged marriages. And from there they started drifting toward and what do you do in your arranged marriage when you have to have sex with somebody you don't know? And so I decided, well, this is, this is going nowhere. So I just stopped talking and I went into fast footwork. And then I started turning around and around the room and the students started backing up against the wall. And then I started turning in place and I said, how many did I do? And okay, so they never knew. So I just said, how many did I do? They never knew. By that time I had them quiet and we could go on to more topics. And so uh, that was young audiences. And uh, I just want to go back now. I've told you lots of different ideas that raise them about improvisation. And uh, I want to, again, um, 
emphasize that I never thought that improvisation was made from thin air. The more I learned, the more I practiced, the more that was stuffed into my head. I didn't have to read it, it was there. And I had structures. My structures were the music, the repeating melody. In no matter what time cycle, you've got a melody that keeps you in there. You have the drum and you have, um, you have this, the ball parhunt, the words, and two other structures, which I'll mention, but it was never from thin air. Everything was in improvisation was buttressed by thousands and thousands of hours of practice. I did not, I, I searched when I was doing my research for my paper on improvisation. Um, I searched the curricula of many of the big schools, eminent schools now, 2020, and I found the word upanj, uh, which means improvisation, only in the end of year exams, as if you were suddenly going to know how to create an upanj just by having danced and learned your guru's repertoire. Uh, that's really not going to let you be independent. You're always going to have to do something that is pre-composed. So uh, not agreeing with that, I, I started thinking about all of the aids to improvisation which we have. We've done some. Ti hai, ta te tat, ta te tat, ta te tat. This is one of our standard endings for an improvisation. We'll do some dancing and then we end. It signals, okay, we've come to the end of that section. Um, and uh, Lehra, the melody, Teka, the drums, and Jugal Bundi, which is a, 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 a pair tied together. That's what it means, Jugal, a pair tied together. So in, in the West, improvisation is taught as a subject, which many students repeat that class over and over. The teacher is making you feel comfortable, not humiliated and scared. Everything that you do leads toward feeling comfortable on stage when you're improvising. Um, the teacher will talk, one of the teachers whom I know who teaches improvisation talks of the technique as being the letters and the words and what the letters and the syllables and you put them together in words. They are words, little, we call them licks in jazz or in Baroque improvisation, which they also teach the ornamentation. Um, those are the little phrases of ornamentation that then can be put together and into a long sentence. Um, all of these are elements of improvisation. Uh, and I would like to end with, um, if I have time, do I have a, a two more minutes to do a, a participation with the audience? Um, Anyway, I'll do a participation which is called a Sawal Jawab question answer or Jubal Bundy. And this is a favorite um, technique for bringing the audience in. I do a phrase in my feet and you do it in your feet, you answer. Um, so I'm gonna start with simple ones, but we're going to do it with music. And so you hear the structure. We don't need to think it. We don't need to speak it. We hear our structure and we can stay within that. And I'm going to do it now. I'll hold my hands like this. Dig 
正正正正正正正正正正正正正正正正正正正正正正正I'd like to thank you for listening to my ideas. As I said, I'm very indebted to Fulbright for helping me to reach a next level of my training, which is research and becoming a, a real member of the um, family of Katak. Two weeks ago, we had a, an online festival where my guru, Pandit Birju Maharaj, uh, invited his very senior students to show some of their choreography. And I showed my choreography called Mozart Ayana. Ayana means the travels of. I said the travels of Mozart. I took Mozart's last symphony, the last, the final movement, and choreographed it in pure kata. He and his senior student, Shashwati, whom I've known since 1969, uh, appreciated that choreography very much. They did not consider it outside of the tradition, but a new addition. So Fulbright helped me to reach that stage that I knew that critical mass so that I could create within it, I could do research within it, I could ask questions, I could learn. Thank you very much. And thank you for learning about improvisation in the great art of Katak.